towards the light. I think one of the most uh, fantastic things about Martina's world picture is that it is an eternal world picture. And sometimes there are some misunderstandings when students are discussing the Martinus cosmology. And Martinus also himself heard there were some misunderstandings. And in the beginning of the fourth volume of Leavitt's Bow, he takes up a special problem. You make some mistakes in your thinking. Because Martinus has made eternal analyses and then he has made some analyses that are limited by time and space and if you mix the two perspectives and mix eternal analyses with more with analyses from the created world which is more temporal limited by time you make some mistakes in your thinking and what is so fantastic about Martinus' world picture, that is that he has made an eternal world picture. He, t- he takes everything into account. I have a joke with my good friend Andrew. When I ask him, Andrew, how is life? He is supposed to answer, life is eternal. <laughs> how is life? Life is eternal. Um, what is the most important thing in life? Uh, people normally say that is love or health or good humor and so on. But in a way, seen from the point of the cosmology, the most important thing in life is that you can experience life. If you cannot experience life, there is no life. So that's the most important thing in life, that you can experience the life. And in order to be able to experience life, you need to have contrasts. If everything was the same, you could not experience anything. You cannot uh, make a make a book when you are printing with white ink on white paper. If you take a, f- a photography, a picture, black and white, what is most important, the white or the black part of you? Or if you take the old symbol with yin and yang, what's, what is most important, the black part or the white part? They have the same importance. You cannot experience anything without contrasts. Has Martinus invented the principle of contrasts? No, he has not invented this principle. It is something that is. When did this principle come around? When was it created? When did we, for the first time in the world history, see the principle of contrasts? It has not had any begin. It has always been like this. That means that the principle of contrasts is eternal. In order to understand Martinus' cosmology, you should be able to distinguish between eternal things and created things. Normally, we only work with created things, and all created things has a beginning and has an end. And there is a reason why a created thing exists. There is a piano or a lamp or a door, There is a reason why these things exist, had a beginning, and they will have an end. But there is some other things that is eternal things. For example, in in natural science, they they speak about the, the, the sentence about the constants of the energy. The first sentence of the thermodynamics is, the sum of energy is constant. And that, in a way, means energy is eternal. You could ask, when did the energy come around? When did the energy start to exist? When was the energy created? It's always been there because it's constant. So it's impossible. It cannot have been a time where there was no energy and suddenly there was some energy. Then it's not constant. And when will the energy disappear? It can never disappear because it's constant. Why does the energy exist? It just simply exists. There is no explanation. And to many people that's very strange. So that means for all created things there is a purpose. There is a reason why they exist. But there is no reason why eternal things are existing. They just simply exist. They have an existence. And that's it. It's not only the energy that is constant. You could also show life is constant. When did the life come around? When, when was life created? 
because in, in, in universities they think, when did the universe start? When did life start? Because they think the universe and life are created things. Then they must have had a start and there must be a reason why they exist. But in a way you could say the sum of life is constant. Life never started. Life cannot disappear. The materialists have a big problem. They shall try to explain how dead molecules have got consciousness. Can you imagine once there was absolutely no consciousness in the whole universe? Totally dead. All molecules were dead. But then suddenly some molecules got consciousness. What happened when these dead molecules got consciousness? They say when the molecules are very, very complicated, consciousness is created spontaneously. <laughs> but I think that's no, no explanation. But that's sort of what the biologists are thinking today. When we have very, very complicated molecules in the nervous system, they are created spontaneously. That is the theory of emergence. Uh, em em yes, they, they, they emerge. They just simply emerge out of nothing. But I think... Natural science will never succeed to explain how dead molecules turn into molecules with consciousness. No, consciousness is also an eternal phenomenon, just like energy and just like life. Consciousness has never been created. Consciousness always existed and will always exist. So our, our, the self, our I, is an eternal thing, our consciousness is an eternal thing, the energy is an eternal thing, there is no reason why they exist, they cannot stop to exist. The theme, the road towards the light, I would like to treat it also from two different kinds of point of view. First, from the eternal point of view. Now I've, I've, I've talked about the principle of contrasts are an eternal principle. But there are also other eternal principles. Martinez talks about a principle of hunger and satiation. That means that uh, the driving force in all life is that the living beings want to experience what is pleasant and they try to avoid what is unpleasant. And when you are fed up with a thing, you are satiated, you don't want any more of this thing, it appears to you as it is something dark. Maybe you should have some Danish layer cake, and it's paradise to eat such a Danish layer cake, but maybe when you had three, four, five big pieces, it has turned into darkness. You, 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 you would vomit if you should take one piece more, and then it has turned into, into hell, sort of. You have been fed up with it. So then it has turned into darkness. So from one point of view, you could say, all things that you are fed up with are in your past. And that's darkness. And when you have wishes and desires, you want to have them fulfilled. And they are fulfilled in the future. So that means, and that is wonderful to have your wishes and desires fulfilled. So that means light is always in front of you. So if you see it in the eternal analysis, life is an eternal journey towards the light because you are fed up with the past, that's darkness, and you are longing for the future because all your wishes are fulfilled in the future. So from that point of view, uh, the whole eternal life is a road towards uh, the light. And I was talking about these mistakes of, of, of the thinking. What is so fantastic about Martin's world picture is that he justifies the darkness. He shows there's a meaning with the darkness. He defends the darkness. Uh, and he justifies the, the darkness. That is because of this principle of contrasts. And he's speaking of the principle of hunger and satiation. But he's also speaking the problem of, of, of cycles. Everything goes into cycles. It doesn't matter whatever time you say that's a part of the day, a part of the year, or, or 
if if we also um, have four different states, things can be in the solid state, liquid state, in a gaseous state, or in a, in a spiritual state. And whatever time or thing you are pointing at, it is in a part of, of, of a cycle. But in each cycle, there are two contrasts. We have night and day, summer and winter. The two contrasts are always represented in 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 a cycle. So the eternal life is going into cycles. And you cannot say that one contrast is better than the other. I always use the example about temperature. If we only had one temperature, we would not know when it is cold or it is warm. We would have no idea about that. But now we can say, oh, today it's, it's rather hot today. How do you know that it is hot? Because it was cold in winter. And now it's very cold. How do you know it's cold? Because once it was warmer. That means you can only experience one contrast when you have experienced the opposite. But which one is best? If you have been freezing for a long time and it's heating up, then the heat is paradise. It's so wonderful. So then the heating up, the heat is light. But if you have to go in the heat for a long, long, long time, you are fed up w with the heat. And at the end, the heat has become a hell. And then it's so refreshing with a cold breeze. So then the cold breeze is paradise. What is good and what is, parad what is paradise and what is hell? That's not the thing in itself that determines that. That's your position. Are you fed up with the thing or are you longing for the thing? What about water? Yeah, if you are drinking in, if, if you are drowning, not drinking, drowning, <laughs> if you are drowning in a, a, a lake, water is hell. If you are wandering in the desert, you have nothing to drink, water is paradise. What about water? Is it paradise or hell? That depends on you if you are satiated or if you are longing for it. Martinus uh, talks about the laws of life. Martinus has been able to experience the laws of life, the eternal principles of life. And he has expressed them in his spiritual science. But now and then they can also be expressed in art. And it can be in singing or in novels. And Martinus says, if uh, uh, an artist or someone who has created some art, has materialized an eternal law in this art. This will be classic. This will be an evergreen. And personally, I love very much Liza Minnelli singing, Life is a Cabaret. And I think you could almost say that has become an evergreen, almost a classic. Life is a Cabaret. But that is because it is a cosmic truth. In a way, this sentence is a cosmic analysis. Life is a cabaret. If you would ask Martinez, what is the meaning of life? What is the meaning of life? Once in answer, there's no meaning. That, that depends. If you say, the meaning of life is to become a Christ being, the meaning of life is to get cosmic consciousness and become a, a perfect human being. But what shall I do then afterwards for the rest of the eternity? Then there is nothing to do the rest of the e eternity. So, in that we don't have, if we have an eternal life, there cannot be a goal. Because when you have reached the goal, that's the end. But eternal life cannot have an end. But Martinez put it another way. The meaning of life is just simply to experience life. What's the meaning of life? What's the big deal? That's just that you can experience life and that you always can experience something new. That means that life is entertainment. Life is a theater. Life is a cabaret. That's the meaning. But you don't want to see the same movie or the same piece all the time. You want to have it change. So, if an eternal living being should be able to experience something new for eternity, it is absolutely necessary to have access to both contrasts for eternity. 
in the Christian religion and other religions, you, you are dreaming out reaching nirvana and paradise. And then I'm going to live in the light for the rest of eternity. <laughs> but then it would only be light, 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 light. You would forget about the darkness. There is also an eternal principle of perspective. If you see the trees along a road, they are very big here in the, in the near horizon, but in the far horizon they get smaller and smaller. It's so with all things. Things are something in themselves, and another thing is how you experience them. And when they are very remote, you feel them as small. So when we have experienced something dark, it's nice to experience the light, but when very much time has passed, they are getting smaller and smaller, according to the principle of a perspective. And at the end, everything is light, and then there's no contrast, and you are blinded, you cannot see anything. So, Buddha and Jesus, they might, they knew certainly these laws, but the people at that time, they could not understand so much. It was enough for them to explain for them that they should uh, try to reach perfection, to to get cosmic consciousness, and then they, di they did not have to tell any more. But uh, Martinus should reveal a whole world picture, a, a, a logical world picture. So he had to take everything into account. So the meaning of life is just simply that we should be able to experience something new for eternity. Therefore, life is a cabaret. But this mistakes of thoughts could be in this way that Martinus concludes in his world picture, everything is very good. And a devil and the darkness doesn't exist because the darkness is an advantage for the living being. Otherwise, it would not be able to experience. Uh, for example, you could say, it is impossible to know that you are happy if you have not tried to be unhappy. And if you can become very, very unhappy, you also can become very, very happy. And in his analysis, all his writings, Martinus shows that the universe has been constructed in the best possible way. Martinus shows there is nothing that could be better in life but I guess you in your personal life could mention quite a few things that could be better. <laughs> but I think it's so fantastic that Martinus shows that everything cannot possibly be any better. But um, in my lectures before my the question period, I've sometimes asked people, could you give some suggestions how life could be improved if you were our Lord yourself, if you were God? and had the power to change something here in life and change something in the universe, what would you change? But you think it's impossible. It is as good as it can be. But normally people suggest, oh, I would, um, then I, there should be no war, there should be no illness, no unhappiness. And all the suggestions that I've heard is about to, they will take something of the darkness away. They will remove the darkness. But if you could take 30% of the happiness, unhappiness, if you could remove, take away 30% of the unhappiness, at the same way you would also take away 30% of happiness. You could only be a little bit unhappy, but then you could only become a little bit happy. So then, in a way, life would have been, become pure, poorer, poorer. There was not so much to experience. If you can take some, where, something away, you don't have the same possibilities as, as before. But what I would mention, that was the atomic bomb and this, how you can mix the, the perspectives between created things and eternal things. From one point of view, Martina says, the biggest mistake that mankind has made was to make the atomic bomb. That was the biggest mistake. You cannot make anything worse than throwing an, an atomic bomb on other people. That's, that's the worst thing. So from one point of view, you could say, that's the worst thing people can do. But on the other hand, Martinus say, oh, atomic bombs, they are very good. Because everything is very good. <laughs> then atomic bombs is also very good. So, I mean, then if two people are discussing 
Martinus says the uh, atomic bombs is the worst thing that exists. No, Martinus says that atomic bombs is very good. And then we have the uh, this mistake that often takes place when we discuss the cosmic analysis of Martinus. And that's because you can you you are not uh, conscious about you have to divide or be conscious about is it is it an eternal analysis or it is an, or is it an analysis that is limited by by time and space as an analysis of created things or is it an analysis of eternal things but he has put it together in two words he he already in in paragraph number 6 in the book of life he talks about that there are something in life they are very unpleasant but it is good because it gives you possibilities to experience life so what we call darkness the bad things that is the unpleasant good and then we have the happiness and the light and that is the pleasant good and i think that's so ingenious because in in two words he has the two point of view the two analysis if you say unpleasant that's the created analysis but good that is the eternal analysis unpleasant good Pleasant, that is the created analysis, and good, that is the eternal analysis. So there he has put it together. So life can be the pleasant good or the unpleasant good. So from the eternal point of view, I'm just repeating now, the, from the eternal point of view, the, the road towards the life, towards the light, that is our everyday life, all living beings are all the time going towards the light. Life is an eternal Christmas. <laughs> because, you know, at Christmas time, you have your wishes. The children are wishing a lot of uh, presents, and they get them at Christmas Eve. Then they are so happy because their wishes are fulfilled. That's so. You are so happy when your wishes are fulfilled. But Martinez guarantees all your wishes are fulfilled. You just have to have a little bit of patience. That's maybe the problem. And I can guarantee you no one of you will die with all your wishes fulfilled. No one. But it's just to have some patience. And then you have a, a, a life in a paradise in the spiritual world. But he says there are some threads that are binding the physical lives together. And that is unfulfilled wishes and desires. Because you are there in this um, summer holiday on the spiritual plane, a kind of paradise, but there are some wishes they can only be fulfilled in the physical world. And for that reason, you want to come back to the physical world. But I think that is a, a fantastic perspective. All your wishes are fulfilled. Just have a little patience. And then I would, uh, yes, more or less start on my lecture. <laughs> because the title of the lecture is also the title of symbol number four. And symbol number four is the road towards the light. It is in the beginning of the eternal world picture. And at that time, Martinus has not yet explained the whole world picture. He has not explained the six kingdoms. But just to get started, he has taken a part of the spiral cycle. And he has taken the part that we are knowing, that we know. And with the indigo color here, Martinus symbolizes the mineral kingdom. And with red color, the plant kingdom, orange color, the animal kingdom, and this is the real animal kingdom. And terrestrial man also belongs to the animal kingdom, but we are here in the later part of the animal kingdom, and this is the real human kingdom. And the stars here, the red star, just symbolize the beginning of the plant kingdom, the beginning of the animal kingdom, and this is the beginning of the real human kingdom. And... That, in a way, is the light. We are going towards perfection. We are going to be Christ beings or God-like beings. And now, my dear friends, God is talking to you. You think I'm crazy, but I actually am a cell in the body of God. 
So from that point of view, actually God is talking to you through one of the cells. But then the physical part, the secondary consciousness. This is a very special part in the evolution. And you could also call it the school of life. And you can say there is a meaning in the physical world. There is a purpose of the physical world. The purpose of the physical world is to create consciousness. There are minerals which have no consciousness on the physical plane. Plants has a little consciousness. They can experience life and frost and heat and when they are torn apart and so on. Animals have more consciousness than plants and terrestrial man have, has more consciousness than the animals and Martinus use, uses such nice words or interesting words. He compares the physical world to the womb of the mother. He compares it to the uterus. The embryo, the fetus, is developing nine months in the uterus. And then the baby is born into a much bigger and more fantastic world where they can experience quite a lot. But the physical world is a cosmic womb. That is the cosmic uterus. where the So we are not really born yet. There is not much space in the uterus. But there is also, we are very, very limited because we are limited by time and space. When we get cosmic consciousness, we can see the spiritual reality which lies behind uh, everything. Martinus also uh, has expressed it in another way. He, he, he tells us there are movements. We can see their movements here, the plants and human beings. They are moving. Molecules, atoms, electrons are moving. Everything down in microcosmos is vibrating. We are moving. Planets, solar systems, galaxies are moving. We are living in an ocean of movements. I mean, it's so fantastic. Everything is moving, at least everything in the physical world. And then Martinus asked, what do we witness when we see this ocean of movements? What do we see? We are witness to something, all these movements. And Martinus had a fully developed intuition and therefore he could put it very simply because with, with the intuition you can see the principles, the, the, the ideas. It's a, almost a spiritual x-ray <laughs> sight. You can th see through everything and cut it down to the principle. And it is fantastic that all these movements in micro, meso and macrocosmos, Martinus can answer the question with three Words. What do we witness when we see all the movements? God creates consciousness. God creates consciousness. And Martinus, by consciousness, Martinus means development. God creates consciousness. That means there is a, a creation ongoing and creation is the same thing as development or evolution. There is also another very uh, intuitive point of view on life. Martinus has this cosmic definition of God. God is the sum of all living beings. That means that my surrounding, all my surroundings, everything that is surrounding me is the living universe. And from that point of view, there is only two living beings. That's me and the living universe. Only me and the living universe. And when the energies come from the surroundings and they are meeting my energies in the eye or the ear, there is a reaction. And this reaction is my experience of life. That means, in a way, every Single person is all the time talking to God or talking or communicating with the living universe. And for that reason, Martinus talks about the 
direct speech of life. Every single person is the object of the direct speech of life. We are raised and grown up and taught by God, sort of. That means we meet energies from the surroundings. That is my fate. But this is a teaching, an upbringing. So the direct speech of life is upbringing and teaching. But the direct speech of life can also be love and entertainment, can also be very wonderful. But when we are brought up and taught different things in the school of life, it can be a little bit tough to take these lessons. When I, when I went to school, we had to study something about the, some French authors. It was the French existentialists, uh, Sartre and UNESCO, and uh, you know all this about the absurd theater and so on. And their conclusion were, was life is an absurd theater. And they are right if we only have one life. Then there is no logic, there is no uh, meaning in life. But if you have an eternal world picture, you can see the meaning in life. But without an eternal world picture, you must, as a logical modern man, come to the conclusion, life is an absurd theater. If you take a text there can be a person who is illiterate, cannot read, and there can be a person who can read. They can see the same physical letters. They have the same physical sight. They can see the, le- the letters. They physically seen, they see the same thing. But one can understand the text, and the other cannot understand the text. So when you are an illiterate, you can see the physical phenomenon, but you cannot understand it. And Martinus says that normal man today, normal atheists and uh, godless uh, materialistic people they are illiterate they cannot understand the direct speech of life and that's the reason why Martinus has written the book of life it's a grammar where you can learn to understand the direct speech of life so you should not be an illiterate there is not nothing in in life that takes place by chance There is a meaning in everything. It might look as if it takes place by chance, but every single thing in your life is addressed personally to you. It can be as love and entertainment, but it can also be a kind of teaching and upbringing. And maybe you could accept that the planet Earth is a living being, but all living beings are thinking. And maybe you could accept that the sum of all living beings is a living being, the living universe, but then the universe is also thinking. I think that's a fabulous idea. The universe is thinking. That's the same as say God is thinking. And then Martinus says, I know what, Mart- what God is thinking about. <laughs> so that's also so fantastic in Martinus' world picture. Martinus explains what God are thinking. And for that reason, he also mentioned a, a sentence in the Bible. In a certain place, they let God say that God wants to create a man in his picture, in his likeness. Just And in a way, that is the purpose. That is the theme of all life in the physical world. That is what the physical world is about. That is that God wants to create a living being in his likeness. And then to be God-like, that is to be a God being, a a Christ being, a being that only can practice neighborly love. So that's a fantastic project. And life is certainly not an absurd theater. Life is a cabaret with a very good uh, entertainment. But then we need the two contrasts in order to be able to experience life. And that means in order... In order to um, appreciate that you are one with all other living beings, you should also experience the contrast to be separated totally from all other living beings. In order to appreciate the love of God, you should also be able to experience the opposite. 
in order to be able to appreciate that you have an eternal life, you shall also have the possibility to experience the contrast. So at some part in the eternal life, you should be able to lose your consciousness of eternity. And that is exactly here in the animal kingdom. And we are in a physical body, we are imprisoned in a physical body. And when we become materialistic, atheistic, godless, we believe I am identical with my physical body. And when I die, everything is out. You cannot feel more separated from God, from other living beings, and you cannot be more separated from this idea of immortality. There are people who have had cosmic glimpses where they have experienced with their own senses that they are immortal. And there has been a lot of programs, also on BBC, I know, on near-death experiences. People have had some accident or some operation, and apparently they are clinical dead. But then they are revived and come back, and they, then they can explain that they have had an experience outside their body. And it's such a fantastic experience. And for most people, that has totally changed their lives, that they have had this opportunity to experience life outside their physical body. They are so happy. It's so fantastic to have this wonderful spiritual experience. I am immortal. I am eternal. They do not fear death anymore. But why is it so fantastic, so wonderful to have this experience? Because we have lost our consciousness of eternity. We have been afraid of losing life. We have been afraid of dying. And that's because we have been so afraid. And also, when our partner, our children, when our beloved are dead, we have cried litters of tears and cried and cried. Cosmically seen, seen for no reason, because we are eternal living beings. But all that sorrow and fear is the contrast to the experience of immortality. So it is an advantage. Therefore, there must be this materialistic state in the evolution, where you lose your consciousness of eternity, and also where you use, lose your consciousness of God. You have to lose your God consciousness before you can appreciate that God exists. Sometimes children, they are almost spoiled by their their parents. And they do not really appreciate the parents. But then if the parents seek them abroad or uh, are sending them somewhere else, sometimes I realize, oh, it was much better at home. They have sort of become home blind because they have not had a contrast to it. But thanks to the contrast, you can learn to appreciate both contrasts. So the most important thing for terrestrial man today, I would say, that is to learn to understand the direct speech of life or to understand the direct teaching of God. You don't have to interest to be interested in these things if you don't want to. But there are more and more people. They are fed up. They are tired. They said, why shall I be ill? Why shall I have this fiasco? Why shall I have problems? Why shall I be depressed? Why shall I be tired? I don't want to be ill anymore. I don't want to be sad anymore. At a certain time, they have had so many problems, crises, illnesses, so they really say, now I want a change in my life. And then they start to seek, how can I change my life? What can be done about it? And then there is a possibility to study the spiritual science, because the spiritual science describes how life is working. That is the, in, the, the eternal laws, the eternal principles. And if you want to put a man on the moon, you have to know all the laws of gravity and electricity and magnetism. But when you know the laws, you can construct what you want. But you cannot put a man on the moon in blind sort of. So if you want to construct a happy fate, 
you have to know the laws of life and find out how it works. And then we have the possibility to study the cosmic uh, analysis and start to understand that life is not an absurd theater. Life is teaching you. Life is helping you. And in all cases, life is an advantage for you. Now I've talked about darkness in an eternal perspective, but you can also talk about darkness in a shorter perspective. We could say now we would only look upon this part in the evolution from the animal kingdom to the real human kingdom. Then you could say the meaning or the purpose is to become perfect and to get cosmic consciousness. That's on a shorter term. And that is a perfect human being can only practice neighborly love. He cannot hurt anyone. There is no egoism. But how can you develop your humane capacity? How can you develop your feelings? Can you go to university and study and get more developed feelings? No, it's not possible. It doesn't help with studies. You cannot develop your feelings or your humane capacity through studies. But if you want to um, develop your intelligence, I could uh, recommend to go to university and study chemistry and physics and econo economics and so on because this, when you read books written on the basis of intelligence, you are training your intelligence. I can also say Martinez books are written on the basis of intuition. And if you are studying and trying to understand what Martinez is writing, you are actually developing your intuition. You are developing your body of intuition. Sometimes we, we make, it, make a joke, you know, this bodybuilding you have to do so to have a strong physical body. But you can also do some spiritual bodybuilding to read Martinez' analysis based on intuition, is bodybuilding for your body of intuition. No, you can develop your feelings through experience. Whenever you have felt some pain, then you have developed your feelings, and then you can feel with others. So the way to more compassion and uh, humanity humane um, abilities, that is experience. That is also the basis of all evolution in Martinus cosmology. Whenever you have made an experience, you have developed. Whenever you have trained and practiced, you have developed. And all the results are collected or stored in the tunnel, talent kernels in the super consciousness. So, in a way, the sufferings are an advantage for us because that develops our feelings. You also might know this symbol here. That is symbol number 16, the eternal body. It shows the law of karma. All the energies you are sending out, they are coming back. Not as a punishment, but as a principle of teaching. What you're doing to others, you can experience on your own body. And you get a feedback on your acts from others. If you do something pleasant to others, it comes back with pleasantness. And if you are hurting others, you are hurt yourself. So this is all sort of turning things up and down. That if you want to become higher developed, you actually want a lot of problems. So take care. If you really want to be a highly humane developed person, you actually want experiences that can develop your, your feelings. And... Um, what is so fantastic about Martin's world picture is that you can learn to take your problems and sufferings in another way. You can, with your intelligence, understand that you yourself are the cause of all the problems you experience. You can only experience things that you have sent out yourself. It's only my own energies that are coming back. And other people, they are only messengers or postman. Normally it is so when you get a bill or an unpleasant letter from the postman, you are not attacking the postman and beating him up because he has come with this letter. 
grateful for unpleasant things because that brings you on in the evolution. Sometimes when I'm looking on the news and television, there are war and crisis and conflicts and many people get depressed when they see these pictures. But I'm trying to tell myself, this is the way in which God are creating the perfect man. This is the way God is creating the perfect man. That means it's so important to start to see God in everything. God is near you in all situations and whenever you are. And then you can go through very much pain and suffering if you are conscious that God is always with you. God is always close to you. But it is a talent that shall be trained just like the piano playing. And I see on the clock I'll have to stop rather soon. But I would also just add, if we have enemies and people we don't like, we can understand they are not the cause. But if we are practicing that we are praying for our enemies, we can we can want the best things for them. We can want that they might have energy, force, power, inspiration. We can also pray that they must, must become more humane and lovable. And uh, this is pure magic. Matisse and Eve says when we are praying for our enemies, there is uh, uh, um, an arc, a, a, row, a bow of energy that is going from the person which goes into the aura of the so-called uh, so-called enemy. And um, Martinus often stresses a quotation from the Bible, that is, those who are pure in the heart, I don't really know the English words, but those who are pure in the heart, they shall see God. And when are you pure in your heart? That is when you can pray for your enemies. That is when you can be grateful and thankful for unpleasant things and pleasant things. Then you are pure in your heart. Then you shall see God. And what does that mean? That means that you should get cosmic consciousness because, and that is sort of the ultimate light for us, the road to what lies. That is to get cosmic consciousness. And then you will experience that you are immortal, you are eternal, and you will experience by your own senses, now not only theoretically, all what you before called darkness and problems and sufferings are love in disguise. It is really love, it is good, but it is the unpleasant good. And then you can experience the consciousness of God, and you are melting together with the consciousness of God and all other fully developed uh, conscious beings. Thank you for your attention.